Welcome to the First Cup Podcast. I'm Rick Gaiman, and this is round one recap of the 3M Open. And joining me, he's usually here on Thursdays. I'm not usually here on Thursdays, but here it is. It's Greg Ducharme. What's up, Greg? Rick, uh, great to have you. Especially this. There's an irony to the start of this round one. The fact that you and Mark switched, it works out so perfectly. Because there's been some scheduling things this week. Like, I had to miss... Tuesday's uh, preview pod, or, um, which was unfortunate, right? And some things happened, and we still submit our picks. And you know, yeah. I'm, I, I'm, let's just say I'm extra happy to have you here today. Okay, well, we'll we'll jump in to. I think I know why because um, I I know who is at the top of the leaderboard. This is this is Richie Wierenski, eight under par, sixty three, and he was your sleeper. Is that correct, Greg? Yeah, he was my sleeper. And uh, what I missed out on Tuesday, actually, Jacob has this. It was, uh, I, I didn't have a chance to defend myself. So let, let's hear it. Our, <laughs> tell you, Greg's is Richie Wierenski, and he is not here to defend himself for that. So I have no idea why he picked Richie Wierenski, but he's 80 to 1. So at the real GFD to find out what's going on there. That's, uh, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to hear an explanation there. <laughs> It's an ambush. It's an ambush. Well, hey, you know, I'm sorry to do that to you. Jacob helped me out with this. So, <laughs> Jacob, great work for you. That's, that's so good. Look, All I right, understand well, where you're coming yeah, from. Yeah, we ridiculed you. We, uh, we laughed about it. We said, oh, Richie, what's he going to do? So what, what was it about Richie Wierenski? Because through 18 holes, looks pretty darn good. Yeah, I've talked to you about the 80-20 rule on the PGA Tour where you make, it's a philosophy where basically you're, you're planning out your strategy of play and you know you're going to make about 80% of your dollars for the year or 80% of your FedEx Cup points, it works that way too, in 20% of your events. So every once in a while, you don't have to make every cut. You don't have to be like, uh, like a John Rahm or Rory McIlroy where every single time you're um, you're in, you're playing, you're in contention. Not everybody's going to do that, but to keep your card and, and keep yourself relevant on the PGA tour, you need to have weeks where you pop up. And Richie Wierenski is one of those kind of pop-up guys earlier this year in the first event of the year, tied third at the Greenbrier. Uh, and, and coming into this week, he had made four straight cuts. Now look, four straight cuts, I think tied 21st was his best of the, of the four. So it's nothing spectacular. There was one round here where he'd shoot a 72 in the third round, and it kind of put him out of immediate contention. But he's starting to play really well. And so there's definitely risk in this, and uh, it's definitely a little bit lucky. You may say lucky, or I have a crystal ball. Either way, you choose to I'll go with it. crystal ball. Right. But you're, you're kind of grasping at straws. And I'm just watching a guy who's starting to play a little bit better, who's due for a pop-up week. And I thought this was the field for him to do it. So I took a chance. That's the art of a sleeper. The beauty of a sleeper is they're not safe picks. Uh, and I saw a little something there. So here we go. We'll see if he can hang on through the rest of the week. A wire-to-wire Wierenski oh, win. <laughs> okay, do you know the last wire-to-wire winner on the PGA Tour? Oh, this is like one of those trivia games we were just I know. Playing. Actually, I'm like only like 75% sure I know the answer to this. So it's not a great trivia question. I know um, one of the last. I don't know if he was the last. Wow. Um, um, was it Justin Thomas at the BMW last year? I don't know. I'll I don't even know if up. he won wire to wire. <laughs> who do who do you Nate, have? So Nate Lashley definitely did it. Did Tiger do it at Zozo? Did he go wire um, to wire or did he just lead the first round and then he won? Well, he started with three bogeys and then still led oh, that's the first right. round. That's so right. That, yeah. I don't know if he went wire to wire. Right, also, we'll that, I have, we'll I have one up. other one to throw at you. Sure. Did Nick, did Nick Taylor... Oh, Win you know wire what? to wire? I think he did at Pebble. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. This is yes. He did. Jacob's giving me the yes, he did sign. So, wow. yes, so he that did. was probably the most recent. But yeah, it doesn't happen in like February. Yeah. Uh, well, anyway, in terms of staying power, so normally your first round leader is the guy that just rolled in every 50 footer for 18 holes, uh, which Wierenski did. He gained four strokes putting, but I will say. He gained three tee to green, which is at least a lot more optimistic than a lot of these guys that you get who go out and shoot some wacky low number and then you never see them again. Yeah, you're, look, th this is the hard thing about the, the model. Like, do you want, you got to find a balance here. You yep. want a guy that's playing well, right? And obviously, if you're shooting eight under, you're playing well. We, we usually hold that against you because it's unlikely you're going to do it two days in a row. But at the same time, 
the guy that's going to play well tomorrow is going to hit it well and putt well. So could he do it again? Yeah, he absolutely could. And does he have to? Well, he doesn't have to do what he did today. He's not going to have to shoot eight under every day to get the job done. So um, I, I look at it with kind of, you know, I, I, the model definitely works. But at the same time, you got to take a little caution because you don't want to take a guy who's put in horribly because mm-hmm. there's probably a problem there. It's unlikely that he's going to putt great the next day. So more likely that Richie putts better than a guy that putts terribly today, but less. You're right. It's not likely that he gains four strokes again tomorrow on the green. All right. He might not have to. He might just need to gain one a day and just keep striking it. He might be okay. Yeah. Uh, Michael Thompson is here. He's in second, seven under 64. I don't know if there's much to say about him other than the fact that he won the Honda Classic, I believe, in it was 2013. He won a Corn Ferry Tour since then. Another one of these guys that has his, has his card always hanging around. He's like 200th in the world. Yeah, you're right. He's a, definitely a card keeper. And the one thing about him, it's been a really tough go of it until last year. He really hasn't had a, a, a much to write home about in his career other than his win. And he's been getting into, uh, into PGA Tour events kind of through like reshuffles and, and strange situations. He ha- hasn't really been a full member um, for, for all that long. But he last year in 2019, from the Desert Classic until the Honda Classic, had, two, had three top tens. Uh, tied 13th uh, his worst finish in that stretch was tied 16th so we ran together this like stretch of great play and he is a great player he's got a great golf swing went to the university of alabama so there's definitely some potential there he's a good player it's just he hasn't really been playing great for quite some time so i mean looking at his career kind of breakdown it's a little bit uh frightening for many years so you know you never know what you're going to get but basically it hasn't been great. Let's talk about the big name at the top of the leaderboard, or near the top of the leaderboard, I should say. Six under 65 for Thursday, Tony Finau, who seems to have a knack at jumping out in front now. He was the uh, first-round leader last week at the Memorial. He's six under 65. He's within two shots of Richie Wierenski here. And I guess the big news that came out over the week is that Tony uh, splits with his longtime caddy, Greg Bodine and is now now has uh Boyd Summerhays on the uh excuse me Boyd Summerhays on the back which is quite frankly he's kind of just said like I you know need a new voice need something different this is what I think Jordan Spieth should do 749 on the timestamp for Jordan Spieth I think this is what Jordan Spieth should do well look I mean change can be good it can definitely have its <laughs> benefits um but yeah i mean i I, I completely missed that soundbite by the way that's all right it was there it was a good one um (laughs) the he played well he was uh tony was great uh off the tee he was great on approach i mean this it it is not a skill set issue with tony finau it is can he do it for four straight days and close it out yeah and there's so many different paths you can go down with him but the first one one week out off the memorial i think back to the same thing we said last week which is what jack nicholas said jack said he tried to play okay you know he tried to just kind of not lose on thursday oh that's right yeah right and then come friday he wanted to build on that play a little better and by saturday he wanted to be playing his best and try to hang on to that for Sunday. And sometimes I look at players who get off to these really hot starts and can't close it out. And I just wonder if the pacing is an issue. Like they get out there and they just have to go nuts right away and they run out of steam. And it's not a talent thing. It's just like a a flow of the tournament kind of a situation where you're not at your best at the time when you need to be at your best. Because everybody's going to have ups and downs through a four-round tournament. It's 72 holes of golf. You're not going to play them all uh, extremely well. It's very, very unlikely. So I wonder, is this another situation where Tony's kind of jumped out ahead and the pacing is off or, and I'm asking you this, Rick, do you think that, you know, starting at six under and a couple back is kind of a nice place to crouch and wait? I kind of do, right? I like the striking distance thing. I like him to be within striking distance, but not necessarily be in the lead. I think that's fine. Yeah. Uh, this there's this we have a stat here. I think this is a producer Jacob stat. This is a great stat. Uh, round by round uh, scoring since the restart. First round twenty four under. Second round ten under. Third round eleven under. Final round five over. And it's courtesy of Justin 
Ray, friend of the pot. This wow. is, uh, it, it's mental, right? Like, it's just mental. Well, I mean, there's, there's clearly something going on. Again, I don't know if it's, if it's a, a mental thing. Maybe it's a pacing thing. Maybe it's a strategy thing, like Jack said. Maybe, maybe it's a strategy thing. Maybe that's why right. he splits with the caddy, right? And maybe just needs a different voice. Maybe doesn't like the way they're strategizing out there. That's a good one. Yeah, I, I don't. And again, I don't know. These are it's hard to win PGA Tour events, and there are a lot of players when they get near the lead that don't play great on Sunday. It's more common than guys that do play great on Sunday when they're when they're in the lead. That's why it's we always say it's easier to chase than it is to lead. It's a there's a lot of stress and pressure, and Tony's got to feel right now like he's playing really, really well. And I know that last weekend was extremely frustrating. I was kind of weary on playing Tony Fina this week because I thought last week had a real effect on him. I mean, to to contend in a big tournament like that yeah. and perform that way, when you know inside, you know you're underperforming. Like Boyd Summerhays has said, Tony Fina wants to be the best player in the world and believes that he can do it. So, you know, it, are you just not living up to your own expectations? Where's the Where's the pressure coming from? And why is it leading to these results? So I have so many questions about Tony, and I just want to know, like, is this the week where it all changes, or is this, are we in for it again? I got to tell you, I, I felt very impressed with his round because of what happened last week, the carnage. Like, that, that drains a lot of guys. Oh, and yeah. for him to melt down on a very difficult golf course and then – come out and shoot like i was impressed by this round so yeah. looking he's forward an to impressive guy yeah looking forward I mean, he kind of gets Sunday. a rap like the guy who can't finish right the guy who can't close oh, but like that's that's not it's looked at from people who sit in our positions here right we sit and watch and observe and critique <laughs> and we say that you know this is you know you're he's choking right but it, there's so much that goes into it and it's a uh, it's a building process and i hope that tony's in a place soon where he can prove everybody wrong and more importantly rick we haven't mentioned this surprisingly uh break the curse of the puerto rico open there it is there it is i hope we can stop talking about this at some point but it keeps rearing its ugly head so we got to talk about it um yeah hopefully come sunday evening we can say the curse is dead and it's been 1200 and i think we're at 1252 and counting or something like that starts of those guys i'll, I'll have to update my number um dustin johnson withdrew from this golf tournament i want to talk all about it but first we're going to take a quick break and hear a word from our partners and we're back dustin johnson greg shoots two 80s yeah. at the memorial he shoots a 78 in round one of the 3m open which Included a very Tin Cup-esque moment in which he just continues to reload and hit three balls into the water on, I think it was 17? Uh, well, I believe it was, no, Wait it was on his, it was. Oh, um, yeah, he started on the 10th, right? Yeah, that's right. So it was on uh, his first nine. And I don't, I don't remember if it was eight or nine, so forgive me. I have it right here. It was 18. It was 18. 18, so, yeah, yeah, right. It was his ninth hole. It was 18. Yeah, he made a quad. Right, he on a par five and withdraws, uh, citing a back injury, uh, which, if it is, if he has a back injury, wishing him all the best and would actually explain a lot of the bad play we've seen from him because otherwise the last three rounds we've seen from Dustin Johnson are completely inexplicable. Yeah, Dustin is obviously extremely talented, right? We know that. Um, he gets this rap where it, it seems like he doesn't care. But it, it, it goes in two different directions. When he plays poorly, it, it's that he doesn't care. When he plays well, it's that he's, you know, cool. he's just so level-headed that like it yeah. doesn't affect him. But the thing is, the, the, in my opinion, the reality is he's the same every time, and he does care. He's just level-headed. And so when he plays bad, it looks like he's mailing it in. I don't believe that to be the case. So – is that back injury? I mean, it's definitely understandable why maybe he would say I uh, fake a back injury, but I don't think that's the case. I think there's evidence that's showing, okay, this guy's struggling with something. It's clearly, a, a, I wouldn't say clearly, but if there's a back injury, it makes so much sense. So go get yourself healthy. Hopefully you can do it for next week. I mean, next week's, of course, he didn't he win last year uh, or the year before. 
But at yeah, TPC uh, Southland, didn't he Brooks recently won it last win there? year? Brooks right. won it last year. And but he's, Dustin, he's dominated the year TPC before, Southland. Hold out on 18 for. Didn't he win in 18? He hold out on 18 from the fairway with like a six shot lead. I think it was at, at TPC Southwind. So, so I can't remember if it was the WGC version or if it was just like the regular event when they switched it, but he's dominated TPC Southwind is, is yeah. essentially right. So you, you would it was not be, the WGC by the way, because you, last year was the first year replaced the Bridgestone. Right. So now you look for like, uh, 23 over in his last 54 holes is insane. Uh, I, I, without looking it up, I can't imagine I can find another 54 hole stretch in which he has played this poorly. Uh, and now we are going to get into this, this portion of the schedule, which is WGC. Then we are going to get PGA championship and then a sprint to the tour championship. And like, it, it's just like, this is such an important stretch of golf for everybody to see Dustin Johnson playing this poorly and trying to figure it out now is like super concerning. Yeah. He's like the forgotten guy this year, right? He, he was the forgotten guy after the president's cup coming back. Cause there's an injury. Everybody's talking. There's so many players that have a lot of commotion about reaching world number one, who the best players are. I mean, and Dustin was like forgotten and it was just because of an injury. And Dustin Johnson won two starts ago. Yeah, I, I know. I this know. It's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. So he got his win and now it, he's going to, he, he got his win to keep the streak alive. And now he's going to go back to forgotten man. I, I mean, how long do you think, do you really think there's an injury here? Oh man. I hate to speculate on any of this, but if I were Dustin Johnson personally, and I went 80, 80, 78, and I had the WGC coming up, I would be out of town. L yeah. Like, let's just say that. So uh, I would, I would not blame him for, I mean, he'd have to shoot like the course record on Friday to make the cut. Like, I, like, dude, go get healthy, go get ready, get your game in shape. I would be gone now. Yeah. And especially because we didn't like, I, I don't, I don't think there was any indication of this in any of his pressers or anything like that. So I, I, I kind of hope it's not a back injury because that would stink too. Right. Like yeah. I hope he's just getting out of town and going to get right. Yeah. And I mean, either way, go get healthy. This is, What's the cut going to be this What do you think the cut's going to be? You have an estimation on that? I mean, like um, this well, feels like another four under three, three, four under kind of a cut place. So what are so, they at right now? So T62, so T58 right now is one under. So you're probably talking, I bet you it's a toss up between like three and four. Yeah. Typically you go, you double and then add one. So if it gets to three, even if it gets to three, I mean, you're talking getting it to under par for Dustin Johnson would be um, kind of a seemingly since you just shot 80, 80, 78, seems like an insurmountable task. So yeah, he, would I, have to, he would have to shoot like 10 or 11 under on Friday. Right. Just to make the cut. <laughs> just to make the cut. Like on the number, maybe. So maybe, right, yeah, maybe. <laughs> get out of there. But I mean, I do think there's a likelihood that there's something bothering him. So I, I wouldn't go out there and say, well, oh, he's just faking it because he's playing bad. I, I think the bad play is it's more likely that there's something causing the bad play. And then that brings up my question of why would you, if you had a back injury coming in, why would you, why would you risk it? Why would you try to play? This would be the week to, to take off before the yeah. stretch and get right. Yeah. I don't know. I guess we'll maybe we'll hear more about this. Um, I, I think there was a statement from his agent that was like he like we fully expe he's fully expects to play next week. So like that's already out there. So yeah, I, I guess we'll we'll maybe hear more. But uh, when it's it's similar to a lot of guys. Like the the tour is better when when DJ is good and he was great two starts ago. And now we got to figure out what's going on. Yeah. Looking ahead to Friday at the 3M Open, Greg. So we got to figure out kind of this, you know, we kind of chatted about the staying power of someone like a Richie Warinsky. We can kind of talk about some bounce back guys. And, and one of those bounce back guys in theory would be Brooks Kepka, who, uh, uh, it's, what another huge question mark, Greg. Like he missed, I think he, he, first of all, he lost three and a half strokes putting and a lot of them were really short putts. I mean, he was really bad on the greens. I don't know what's going on with him. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little concerned about Brooks. And now he also has mentioned this injury that bothered him again at the Memorial. And he said he, it's cause he's walking downhill when he's walking downhill, it really hurts. And you wonder, I, I don't know when to believe Brooks about the, about his health. Cause he kind of, 
he he kind of goes both ways sometimes. And I feel like when he says he's not hurt, he's trying not to make an excuse, right? My play is my – I'm responsible for my play, and I've just played bad. He says things like that. But then it'll come out that, yeah, the injury may be worse than we thought. So that concerns me. And and then you look at what's plagued him, uh, and, and the putting, as you mentioned today, was not great. And last week at the Memorial, the short game was – awful i mean he was one of 10 out of the bunkers and i know it's tough conditions but for a pga tour player who's been world number one and who's won four major championships to be one of 10 from the bunkers it's not great and i think he was like 10 of 28 scrambling for the week in in its entirety so there's something going on with the knee and there's something going on with the short game and there's something going on with the putting um i don't i don't feel great about it neither do i, I i'm like like I don't know what to do from from like a investment standpoint. I don't know how you could invest in him. Although I will say, like those bounce back guys, plus plus four T to minus three point six putting, that would be a guy to invest in. Similar is uh, Matthias Schwab, who gained three strokes from T to green, lost two point three putting, and then here's a name that we haven't seen near the top of a leaderboard in a long time. Brendan DeYoung shoots a five under 66 now he did it all essentially with a hot putter he gained four strokes putting but how often do we get a guy in outside the top 2000 in the world uh near the top of a leaderboard that's pretty cool yeah it's great it's like a throwback i mean a couple years ago the guy was was around all the time a great ball striker really fun to watch uh i was always a fan of that golf swing but i mean he hasn't had a season where he made more cuts than he missed since 2015 Oh boy. Right. He hasn't, now he hasn't played a lot and I don't know exactly what has been going on with him, but uh, there's definitely some concerns with Brendan DeYoung. And for me going into tomorrow, he's a fade. Let's talk about storylines a little bit for tomorrow. So we're going to keep an eye on Tony Finau, of course. Uh, we've got to keep an eye on Richie Wierenski. Uh, I mean, what else stands out to you? I think Nick, Nick Watney's kind of a cool story. I mean, he shoots a six under 65. He was the first that tested positive for COVID. Now he, he talked about it after his round. That was pretty interesting yeah. stuff. I mean, yeah, and, it sounds and, and, like he's excited to not talk about that. Anymore. Uh, that's exactly right. He sounded like he's, he, and then um, who was doing the interview? Uh, not Steve Sands. Uh, I'm sorry. I can't remember his name, but he was like, I have to ask you like one more question about this. And yeah. 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 Uh, uh, completely. I'm completely blanking on who was doing it. I uh, apologize. But then also we got Matt, Matthew Wolf, six under 65, trying to go back to back. Like this is great story. There's a lot of really good things to look forward to on a Friday. Yeah, I do think Tony Finau is the biggest storyline of the week right now. Um, is he for tomorrow? Tomorrow can go a lot of different directions, and it's not really – like unless he shoots over par tomorrow or shoots 62 tomorrow, I, I don't think the storyline with Tony Finau changes until we get to Sunday. Uh, and so maybe Saturday it'll, it'll, it'll be a real story too. But um, – so I think Tony's the story for the week, but not the story of the day. I, I think a, a Nick Watney and a Matthew Wolf. I'm yeah. so impressed with Matthew Wolf. I don't think this is an easy thing to do to come in and defend your, your first and only PGA Tour event. And he's been a player who's been extremely inconsistent. And I've been waiting. It's almost like you, you've been, you want to say something because you feel like it, but the data doesn't back you up. And I've been wanting to say Matthew Wolf's gaining his consistency. He's becoming more consistent. And I've been just dying to see him put two events in a row together that are pretty good. And to do it here while defending, uh, I'm very impressed. Well, if he wins, he'll actually be able to celebrate with, a, a, with an adult beverage because he, now he's actually 21. Yeah, it's I'm crazy. sure he didn't last year. It's crazy. No, of course not. Um, <laughs> all right, Greg. I think that'll do it for our round one recap. We'll obviously be back at you for the rest of the week. Thanks for joining me, Greg. You can find him on Twitter at the real GFD. You can find me on Twitter at Rick Rungood. This has been the first cut, and we'll catch you next time.